Hey there, today I'm very excited to bring you guys a very interesting video I've been dying to make. Today we'll basically take the camera anywhere we want and explore everything the world of ARMS has to offer. And if it isn't clear yet, this video takes a huge inspiration from Shisa's super amazing Boundary Break series, which I highly recommend watching. Huge thanks to Shadow for making the free camera mod for ARMS, making this whole video possible. So what better place to start than the main man stage itself, Spring Stadium. And I gotta say, this is one of my favorite stages in the game from the sign alone. The outside part of the stadium isn't super detailed, but it makes sense as you're not supposed to take the camera this far away. However, we can see a couple of buildings. A neat trick they've done to save here on resources with these buildings is that they're using flat 2D models to overlay a texture on, giving the illusion of an actual 3D building. And one of the buildings here actually has what seems to be a crane on top of it, but the lack of a proper texture makes it hard to tell what it is, so I'm just gonna say it's a crane. But if you're actually wondering how this place would look on the outside, you can refer to Min Min's Smash trailer or even this panel of the ARMS comic. Now, actually going inside the arena, we can find some more neat details. Like a set of doors around the seats of the stadium, now we know how the fans actually get up here. Another noteworthy place you can find fans in is this VIP room in the center of the stadium. Looking at the signboards around the stage reminds us that this is not only an arena used for arms matches, but also a gym in-universe, dubbed the Spring Gym. Finally, for Spring Stadium, we can spot a pair of speakers around the benches. These are probably the ones used to make announcements. Before the next stage, I actually wanted to show how the main menu works. It is all overlaid over sparring ring, or well, title screen, because yes, this game has two identical copies of the map, one called sparring ring and one called title screen. And this is how the characters are loaded into the character select screen and how the warm-up mode from online arenas work. Anyways, as we move on to Ribbon Ring, we can see that the stage is much bigger than the last one we checked. And here's something interesting, a look at how the light boxes spawn underneath the stage. And here's a look at the backstage area and the giant Ribbon Ring billboard. Now, taking the camera of the arena shows us how big the area Ribbon Girl could perform in is. Honestly, this venue is super big as it can house possibly the most amount of fans of any arena, which according to Biff, it's 50,000 fans. The glow sticks that represent the fans actually follow the camera, so even if you're not supposed to be back here, you can still see them, which is cool. And much like on Spring Stadium, we can see the entry gates on the stage. Now, let's take a look at all the flags that are hanging around the stage. Going outside the stage doesn't show as much, but at least we know that the concert is taking place at night, if it wasn't obvious before. Up next, we have the Rosen Ninjutsu University, or Ninja College. Given how close it seems to be to the city, it makes me wonder how well hidden they are in the world of arms. All we know is that the university is located deep in the mountains, so the city is probably not close and this is just a thing of forced perspective. There's not much out here, so let's continue. We can spot a lot of posters inside the academy that are probably advertising the ninjutsu program. And I just love how some of these are being held by kunai. Around the arms arena, we have a pretty open area which is used for training, as the ninjutsu they teach here was developed by jumping from tree to tree. Pretty effective if you ask me. The fans have comfy spots in this stage, thanks to these watchtowers. And some of the doors here in the entrance have small shuriken patterns, which is neat. We also have the two giant ninja statues. One of them is holding a katana, which believe it or not, was an unused armed class that didn't make it into the game. The logo for the university has a brush, which could be for some sort of art school they have, or just a reference to old Japanese writing. The mausoleum has a bunch of interesting details. If we look under the breakable part of the floor, we can see that the trampoline doesn't spawn in until the floor is broken. The Biff dialogue also mentions that this stage is deep in the woods. 
In both sides of the stage, we can see two entrances that are locked, so my guess is that this is where the characters make their way into the arena. The trees around the arena are actually arms trees, and just in case you didn't know, the arms gene affects all organic life, which also includes animals and plants. Looking at the Grand Prix dialogue again, Biff mentions a mommy hospital, which is actually the one with the giant hands coming out of it, and since this place is a graveyard, here's a look of some of the graves you can spot around the map. For the final detail I want to highlight in this stage, this one is one of my favorite. In one of the advertisements around the stage, you can spot a castle which also seems to be endorsed by the Arms League. Well, here's a closer look at said castle, which is actually in the background of the stage. Maybe it's owned by the owners of the mausoleum, or it could even be a tourist attraction slash hotel for the Arms fans that come to see the matches. I've always wondered what this castle was, and I wish this was one of the locations we explored in-game. Hopefully Nintendo steps up and makes a sequel soon, eh? If anyone here is hungry, then look no further than the Nintendo Noodle House in Ramen Bowl. If you know about Min Min, you know she's ramen royalty, which explains why her family's noodle shop is huge. Honestly, their power and influence can be seen around the ramen city. Just look at it. It's all ramen buildings. I didn't know it was such a big climb to get up here until I started exploring. Well, I'm guessing it's good exercise if you're eating too many noodles. One of the billboards around the stage shows us a ramen lady promoting Nintendo, and judging by how old it looks, it makes me think that this might be Min Min's mom. A lot of these arenas are built to house a lot of fans, but I think I just found the worst spot in the entire game. He is not seeing the fight from here. Dude is literally cheering at the Noodle House's sign. Okay, so now that we talked enough about Min Min and her family's noodle house, did you know that there's actually several other ramen shops here? It just so happens that Min Min's family has the best one in the block. But anyways, here's a look at all the other ramen shops. Other cool stuff I wanted to show was this ramen tower. A look at some of the ramen bowls the fans are eating. And these two hallways which probably house even more ramen shops. Finally, some of the boxes around the bowl have an interesting snail logo that is not seen anywhere else in game. But even more interesting is that some boxes have the Scrapyards logo, so I wonder if Min Min's parents and Mechanica's dad have some sort of deal. But anyhow, this is the perfect segue to the next stage. Scrapyard, hell yeah, the best competitive arm stage! And after that epic transition, I want to start by looking away from the stage. Here we can spot some exhaust towers that are probably also part of the Scrapyard. And even further away, we can spot part of the city. Honestly, I'm not sure how visible this is in-game, but it's still nice to have small details like this. I'm in love with background buildings. Two possible entrances to the scrapyard can be seen. One which is this giant red door with its logo, and this other one I showed you at the beginning. And did you know that this whole stage seems to be held by junk cars? Pretty interesting and resourceful from the scrapyard family. This place is riddled with stickers all around, so let's go over them. First of all, if you are keen-eyed, you've probably spotted all the Ribbon Girl stuff around the stage, like these stickers. And if you guys didn't know, Mechanic is a huge fan of Ribbon Girl, so much so that she even seems to have a scoreboard with the percentages of her matches and even this small drawing in the gate depicting her meeting Ribbon Girl. Funny enough, Mechanica actually drew herself with actual springy arms. Most of the other stickers are just warning signs. It seems like this place has very good safety precautions and would never endanger someone's life. Good to know! More stuff we can see are these road signs and this one promoting what seems to be a construction company. And if you've been wondering about the containers around the stage, they don't have anything in them. And fun fact, apparently the TVs around the stage are used by the scrapyard employees to watch arms matches, and this is how Mechanica became such a big fan. 
Now, what is possibly the most interesting part of this stage is Mechanica's lab. Scattered across the stage, we can see a lot of her blueprints, but inside her lab, we have a gold mine of them. Side note, one of the blueprints outside the stage depict a toaster, Bob, and what looks to be like a mysterious scrap glove type arm. Inside her lab, the place is full of boxes and fuel. Most of the blueprints can't be made out, but some of them have Ribbon Girl's logo. There's also one specific blueprint here, which shows an earlier version of her mech suit with actual extendable legs. I guess she beat the entire internet to it. Her other mech can also be found here, and I like to think this is the one she uses to specifically work on the scrapyard. And the sweetest detail in any of the arm stages can also be seen here. Mechanica has a picture of her and her dad meeting Max Brass on Spring Stadium. And hey, she might have not gotten the arms ability, but at least she inherited the family haircut. Twintel's stage is quite of an odd case. While the stage seems to be heavily based on Hollywood, placing it in LA, Twintel herself is French and so is the name of the stage, translating to Cinema 2. So does this take place in America or does it take place in France? Is the arms world an exact one-to-one -to, -one to the real world? Lore stuff aside, let's start looking at the stage itself. Did you know that this is actually a huge roundabout? The reason why this stage is always so populated, it's because this is seemingly taking place during the premiere day of one of Twintel's movies. And honestly, it looks like this entire city is owned by Twintel. This plaza is filled up with shops for her perfume line, her arm line, her clothing line, and even her production company. Now, here's a quick look at the city. It's pretty empty outside the plaza, but it's always nice to see those small details hidden to the player. Out of all the background buildings, the most interesting one is this one, with a huge Twintel logo on it. Is this one huge office for all her businesses? Similarly, we have a Hollywood-esque sign on the nearby mountains, again with Twintel's logo on it. Some other stuff we can find out here are these Twintel branded taxis. This place is also full of arms trees, and these here just come to show how different the ability can manifest on everyone, even on the trees themselves. Because if you remember, the arms trees on Mausoleum had the ability manifest differently. This specific tree also has its tree trunk way below the ground. Inside the arena, we can see the Walk of Fame, and one of the stars seems to be covered below the carpet, but worry not, it's fully modeled. And right below the front parked cars, we can spot some writing in the arms language. It probably says something like, this parking spot is VIP, or it's reserved. Right here in the red carpet area, we have a peculiar statue of Twinsel. How peculiar, you might ask? Well, she is depicted with the arms ability here, but without a mask. And again, for those of you who don't know, each fighter has a custom-made mask, because without it, their arms would go haywire without any way of controlling them. So the statue's design might have been a genuine oversight or just a stylistic choice. Further in, we have the actual entrance to the cinema, but as usual, there's nothing much to see here. So before I go, I want to show you guys a funny secret this stage has. If we take the camera below the stage, we can spot this lone street lamp just floating for eternity. And honestly, what a trooper. He's been hidden here for 7 years and we are the first ones to find it. So I say that we as a community must give it a name. I'll be taking any and all suggestions in the comments. Buster Beach is up next, and this might be one of the lengthiest sections in the video as I'll go over the stage and all the minigame stages, and considering they all take place in the same resort, I guess it's fitting to do it like this. Anyways, here's a map I made so you can get familiarized with the layout of the resort. I want to begin by looking at the Buster Beach model, and I'll be honest with y'all out here, I've been playing this game since it released in 2017, but I never found a coherent shape to Buster Beach until taking footage for this video and it's supposed to be a fire hydrant. Anyways, around the stage, we can find 8 clockwork cops that are actually acting as referees for this match, so it seems like BNB aren't the only units getting in on that arms hype. And here's yet another variation of the arms tree. The outside of the island is shared with every map, but they all vary in level of detail, so I think it's really worth visiting this place for every Buster Resort map. One thing that is true for all of these maps is that a blimp is always flying around where the action is happening. If you've ever wondered about the balloons and how they spawn, here's a look at that. These are also one of the few 2D textures that always face the camera no matter what. 
And for those of you who have played this stage enough, you might have noticed the seagulls that fly around. These actually follow a looping path that doesn't go too far off the stage, so here's a look at that. Now, off in the distance, we can see a bridge that goes all around the resort and some mountains with houses. The biggest landmark, however, is this huge temple, which I'm 99% sure isn't the Masangan Temple. Each island is connected by a set of interconnected docks, and going up takes us to the Bibo Court. Each court has a very similar layout inside, with the sand and the bleachers. Outside the Vibo Arena, we can see the connecting docks from another perspective, and the island with the temple is way closer so we can appreciate it with better detail. There's something very interesting going on with every artificial island that I want to point out here, but it seems that part of them were made by the scrapyard as well. Just how much money and influence do they have over the mechanical industry in this world? Again, not gonna take much time with the hoops court, but this one has a similar level of detail to V-Bowl, but from a slightly different angle. The Skillshot Island is the one closest to the bridge, so we can appreciate it better. There's also a huge Dodorugan logo in the court carpet. A bit of lore for you, Dodorugan is an industrial company that manufactures arms, mechanical parts, and also seems to have some connection to the Scrapyard and Mechanicus family. Again, seriously, how rich are these people? And finally, the Armgetter Island. This stage actually has no outside detail, which is really peculiar but I won't put my mind into it. This is also the only Buster Resort stage that takes place on a beautiful sunset. First thing I want to look at is the drone spawn and despawn system, it's really funny to see. And more spawn action, here's the targets which actually spawn the same way they do in Skillshot. And finally the extra time clocks. Below the stage we can see a set of lights in the box tray that are never seen by the player. The arm boxes and walls of the stage use the weapon pattern that I really love. There isn't much else here, so I guess we can finally move on. Now, snakeboarding onto Snake Park. Do you guys know that this stage has the most accessible out-of-bounds glitch? So if you really wanted to explore it for yourself, you could. Anyways, we're gonna start from the inside of the stage this time around. I think the most important landmark here is the Kid Cobra billboard. It really shows how popular he is in the snakeboarding scene. Also, his actual hands are still huge. Hidden behind some containers, we can see lots of graffiti that was probably done by Kid Cobra and his friends from the Naja crew, really giving this stage that urban feeling. Another inescapable detail is the presence of the site where Kid Cobra streams to. Surprisingly, this is one of the few in-game brands that we actually know the name of. This one specifically, thanks to the internal file names, we know the name is Brogo. And they seem to have funded the park entirely, because like I said, the presence here is plastered all around. We also have plenty of these fridges with drinks inside of them. Also, here's a better look at the biggest tent in the venue.
A bunch of shipping containers are scattered all around, but it isn't surprising to see lots of them here, as this place has lots of storage buildings. The most interesting container is this one with a fox. He seems to have the arms ability as well. What a neat detail. Nearby the main arena, we can see two other half pipes that are being occupied by fans, as well as a more traditional skateboarding friendly park. A billboard promoting Rogo and the Arms League arm brand can be seen back here. And since we're already here, let's take a look at the giant bridge. We can clearly see where it starts and where it splits apart. There's some direction signs up here as well, but these share the same texture but flipped, so it doesn't give us much information. However, the other ones further ahead indicate that this place is near an airport. And before we go to the city, I want to show you the mountains. They aren't really worthwhile, but I wanted to show everything I could. And this is actually one of the few arenas that use a lot of the model for detail. Huge props for that. And speaking of huge, following this bridge, it leads us to a huge section that circles this building. It splits off on all levels though. This one leads to a seemingly dead end, where cars just disappear and reappear. The other one leads deeper into the city. I also want to take my time appreciating the building design on this stage. Yes, I love and appreciate background buildings. Back here, we can spot billboards promoting other brands And there's even a building under construction. One thing I couldn't understand about this stage is why there's some shiny spots on the ground and why part of it looks like water. I mean, we are in a cargo area after all, but the shape of the body of water doesn't make sense to me. The final map included in the base game was DNA Lab. This stage is a giant library that probably contains ARMS history documents and papers written by the ARMS labs. And while none of these books have interesting spines, some are open and some even have papers hanging from them. So let's look at those first. I want to note that some of these are repeated around so I'm not going through all of them literally. Anyways, get ready for a speed round, because here's the interesting findings in the library of DNA Lab. Starting off with... A book depicting two arms plants. Another book with a snake looking creature. What seems to be blueprints for Helix, or at least concepts. More Helix blueprints. Blueprints for another robot, which seems to work with clockwork mechanisms. Maybe the first ever model of Byte? An old map of the arms world, or at least a region in a country. A weird looking image of a human head with a neck for arms. Even more Helix stuff. More animal notes. One which seems to be a dinosaur. A book depicting UFOs. A paper with more animals, this time with an arms gene giraffe. We have some old pictures of humans with arms powers too. There's this one that depicts the Loch Ness monster of all things. Some more papers with arms plant studies, and also one with the course of the earth for some reason. Right up here we have our first banner which depicts an arms unicorn. Confidential arms ministry documents. This one I can really make out what it is. Another arms animal. Back here in the safe zone, we can see a mural of Helix and one of a woman looking at her arms. However, the most interesting thing here in DNA Lab is this picture of a robot. It is never explained, and everything here in the library looking old-timey just adds to the mystery. Here we have even more plans for Helix, another banner which depicts a similar image from the one we saw with the humans, and finally, inside the stage, we can see some blueprints for Helix and Headlock. Speaking of them, on both sides of the stage we can see the birthplace of both Helix and Headlock. The Helix side has some cages and a giant tube that contained him before he broke out. This really sets him apart from the other tubes we can see around the stage. And on his Grand Prix end cart, we can see him coming back here, how sweet. The Headlock side is much more sinister. It has the statues of important figures in the arms labs, which can actually be knocked down by the player funny enough. One of these statues is strangely locked away in a cage, and then obviously there's Headlock. He's just looking at the match happening very eerily. And to end up the base game stages, here's the inside of one of the smaller test tubes. 
And here's a look at what actually happens when you break it apart. And how could I forget? A look at the stage from the outside. Now, this is where I'd say we move on to Sky Arena, but Sky Arena is just massive. So naturally, I want to leave the best for last. So now we go on to Via Dolce, the first true DLC stage this game had, and it does not disappoint. I adore this stage. So let's start by looking at each side of the street. The side with Lollipop's store seems to be composed of shops entirely owned by her. Good for her, good for her. Biff's side of the street has other stores, one that is owned and operated by the Arms Labs, and that is totally not sketchy. Another one that seems to just serve drinks, and obviously Biff's store, the Arms Cafe, which coincidentally has our single most reliable source of translating the Arms alphabet. You can clearly read the name up here, and Biff outright says it on the Grand Prix. Capital and lowercase a look drastically different, and while Lollipop sells her sweets, Biff right here sells his world famous Biff cookies. And honestly, this man is almighty. Not only does he manage arms league affairs, he is the mascot of the arms board, he helps the fighters out, he has some sort of connection to the labs, runs his own coffee shop, is a link between the world of arms and our world, and is a god. Dude might honestly be one of the most powerful Nintendo characters. There's lots of apartments on the top floors of each store where you can spot the fans cheering on. Exploring one of the sites of the stage brings us to a beautiful looking neighborhood, and this map is just so full of charm and life, it's hard not to love it. Each side has some arms flowers all over the place, what a neat detail. And even further away, we have something that resembles an observatory with a fork for a telescope. The other side has a just as beautiful looking neighborhood. This site is way more interesting, however, as we can see a small town with a river flowing through the middle. The centerpiece of this town is the chapel with a fork on the entrance. Super neat. And even further away, we can spot some buildings that look a little bit like champagne bottles. The theming with the stage is insane. They went so hard with it. Temple Grounds is our next stage, and there is quite a bit to see here. As usual, I want to zoom off as much as possible. There isn't much on the horizon, but this map has an interesting fake wall with a leaf pattern. I'm guessing it's in place to not break the illusion and so that the player can see the low quality skybox. It burns my eyes. Here's a better look at the giant pillars on the top of the temple. They are really hard to see with the trees in the way. And the big centerpiece of this stage is the prophecy. Each symbol represents a character and everyone is represented here. From left to right, we can see Headlock with a bunch of cells, Max Brass is on top. The Lollipops and the Clown Face represent Lollipop. The Jellyfish and the Elastic Figure represent Helix. The Frog and the Pointy Leaf represent Ninjara. The girl in a control pad and the mech represent Mechanica. The liar and the girl with long hair represent Ribbon Girl. The giant arms and the snake represent Kid Cobra. And on the right side, Dr. Coil is on top. The shockwave and Pompidou represent both Springman and Springtron. And the dragon and ramen represent Min Min. The long hair woman and bird represent Twintel. The three masks and the strings represent Masango. The dog and the clockwork represent Bite and Bark and the mummy and ghosts represent Master Mummy. The statue up here actually lights up its eyes if you didn't know, and here's a top view of the full arena. The trees here are also arms trees, which makes sense for such a sacred place. Next, let's go on an expedition inside the temple. It's fairly modeled in some areas here, so just enjoy the ride.
The biggest easter egg in this map is definitely the Stone Scully and Guardian that seem to be lost in time. Does this imply that these are ancient Misangan weapons that the Arms League is using nowadays? Anyways, this next section will be the shortest one in the video. Sparring Ring is the single most simple stage in the game. It doesn't have any outside detail and nothing is really hidden off camera to the player, so here's an alternative look at the cameras. Also, this stage is supposed to be located in the center of the Buster Resort, but this isn't represented in any of the Buster Beach stages, so maybe this stage is really small and doesn't need a huge island to hold it. Interestingly enough, the cameras here actually have a direct connection to Coil's lab, name redacted, and I will go through this one the same way I went through DNA lab, as it turns out that the employees of the arms labs aren't the most organized people. This stage also has a giant library, which shows the studious nature of Coil. Anyways, let's list everything we can see thrown around the arena. First off, we see an arms lab stamp document with Coil's picture on it, but even more interesting, we can see some stolen blueprints from the scrapyard, and judging by the red circles, it seems like Coil is pointing out design flaws in Mechanicus Mech. There's also some sign letters, one of which seems to be from the Ninja College. Was this stolen from Ninjara, perhaps? This document depicts the founding fathers of the arms labs, with Coil being on top. Also around this stage, there are a lot of warning stickers and signs, and here's some of them. Now, down here, we can see some more documents for Helix, but also the entire blueprints she used to create Springtron. And in fact, she has a lot of reference images and data from Springman as well. Further ahead, we can see a pattern for the Arms Lab's Spy Blimp, which we'll talk about later, trust me, this is important. The same Mechanica blueprints can also be found here, but they're way easier to see. Here's a couple of images of Helix and what seems to be a paper that describes how blurbs are made. It seems to be made from actual squid or octopus ink. Up ahead, we have some empty papers and an actual document that depicts early headlock slash chest lock. Funny enough, this stage has a whole dedicated Max Brass corner, where Coil has some pictures of her ex and a study about his one weakness, Peppers. The hating is insane and you gotta appreciate it. We have even more headlock stuff here, and a study about the arms jeans, the eyes, and how to control them with a mask. This little corner here also has some sweets and coffee from the arms lab shop in Via Dolce. There's also this super cute Helix plushie and this album cover looking image of Coil. To end up the outside papers, we have these images of Twintel, and it makes sense why she'd be a target for Coil, considering her manifestation of the arms ability is so unique. And finally, this paper about headlock shows us how it connects to your brain to take over. Inside the arena, we can see an invitation to the party crash, a newspaper section on Coil, a paper explaining some stuff about Chesslock and how Coil suit works, which makes me think that maybe Chesslock evolved into Coil suit, and finally, some blueprints for Coil suit. Now that we're done with the papers, let's take a look at some of the finer details of this stage. First off, this set of TVs show us the Springtron blueprints we saw and a bunch of data of the other fighters. The other side of the stage depicts a scene where one of the statues from DNA Lab has been destroyed, but most importantly, we can see a giant headlock statue being assembled. The implications of this are terrifying, but I love seeing a scene like this in-game. Also, I just think it's so funny that Headlock has a giant branded trapdoor. Like, come on now, you're asking for it to escape. And anyways, since we're looking at the ceiling, the giant wooden ceiling in the stage has the ARMS Ministry logo carved into it. And finally, here's a look at how the punching bags spawn and despawn on this stage. A small detail I noticed here is that the punching bags seem to be held by dead arms drones. What a sad fate. Finally, it's time to look at Sky Arena. This is in my opinion the best stage in arms, at least aesthetically. The beautiful sunset, the epic music, the feeling of this is what you worked hard for, all comes together so epically that you really gotta appreciate it. And this stage is the only one that takes advantage of the entire model, so there's lots to talk about here. 
But before we begin, a small disclaimer, Sky Arena has three models inside the game files, one for Sunset, one for Night, and one used in the credits, and it happens that the credits one is the most detailed one, so for this showcase, I replaced the model to show a more complete version of Sky Arena. Now with that out of the way, let's look at the giant tower first. This place not only houses the giant arena we fight in, but also the Arms League's headquarters. And just like in Spring Stadium, we can spot doors from where the fans enter their seats. And um, I just think I found the worst spot a fan could possibly be in. Yes, even worse than the ramen bowl one. She paid for her ticket and got scammed, imagine. Okay, so let's give this building a tour. Starting from below, we can see the offices of the Arms League, but in the middle of the building, we have this little hub area and a direct elevator to the arena stands. The TVs here just have a logo that says Arms. Following the elevator, we can see it splits off in a little area where the fans can either go left or right, but wherever you take to, you'll end up in the bottom seats, so it isn't really clear how the fans get to the top seats. Maybe they are VIP seats because of the better view? Anyways, the top of the building has an antenna and some lights for airplanes. There's also some text in the arms language that seems to say arms something. I'll put on screen what I think each letter is. The other buildings in the Sky Arena Island don't really seem worthwhile, so here's a good look at most of them. I assume these would be other Arms League related buildings. It's time to finally get off this island and look beyond. The city is super well designed, but I wouldn't expect less from the people that made Mario Kart 8. Which hey, if you want to put an ARMS character and stage in the next Mario Kart, at least you know which stage to choose. Anyways, once here in the shore, we got a whole city to explore. Starting off the right side of the stage, there's a small building here which might be where people rent the boats to get to the island. One of the buildings here has a giant pool on it. I wonder if people watch the grand finals from here as well. This road right here has a series of four roundabouts and also a water canal that leads to the back part of the city. Another building here has an even bigger pool with an even better view of the arena. Some residential areas can be found when looking at the back part of the city, as well as a building with a heliport. How neat. A bigger dock can also be seen. I can't even imagine how much money they make transporting people back and forth during arms season. And from here on out, honestly, there's more of the same. Another heliport, another dock, more residential areas, etc. But if you have a keen eye, you probably notice the giant bridge that extends through the entire city. It's insane and it seems like an infinite loop. It has some points where it leads to other roads, but then it joins back again. Some of the roads even extend behind the skybox, which is really funny too. And honestly, if there was a single place in the arms world I'd love to visit, that place is the Sky Arena City. So now that we're done with the stages, I want to move on into more miscellaneous stuff I didn't show much of. Basically, just some character stuff I find interesting. This is what it looks like when a character uses Headlock in Headlock Scramble. Surprisingly, he actually stays loaded on top of the stage when he leaves. And hey, Lollapop and her fans do have noses below the clown nose. Pretty neat. If you remember in the beginning when I showed off how the main menu was overlaid, we can actually mess with the character select screen too. Here's a look at that. For our last section of today, I want to take a look at the cutscenes. These all take place in Sky Arena, so we don't really have to explore the stage itself. By taking the free camera and moving it inside the cutscenes, we can really see the clever camera work they did. There isn't much to say about these, but I'll pop in for a comment or two. Enjoy!
So remember the spy blimp I talked about in Name Redacted? I theorized that this is how Coil and Headlock arrived so quickly here, and how Coil is planning to make her escape after losing. This is an interesting find I made when actually recording footage for this video, but by going out of the map, you can see the ending video baked into the sky. Maybe this is how it was originally planned to be seen. And for our final detail of today, after the credits are done, the character walks into the crowd. This is a video I've been wanting to make for the longest time on this channel, and I'm honored to finally bring it to you guys. If you feel like I skipped over something or have stuff I should look more in depth at, comment it down below and maybe there might be a small follow up for this video. By the way, don't forget to join the SNG court to get news about this channel and about ARMS in general. 
Also, I want to address the fact that the channel Omega blew up since I last uploaded. And honestly, I'm so glad to have you all here. It really makes me happy to see that ARMS is still kind of making the waves in 2024. And you know, this is probably the video game I'm most passionate about, so I'm really happy to see people enjoy it. So I hope you guys stick for the quality content, and with nothing else to say, I'm SNG, and don't forget to subscribe for more ARMS content. Yeah.